Our speaker for the night will be Vicki Siegel. Siegel? Siegel. Siegel. Um, Vicki works at the intersection of exploration, autonomous robotics, and polar fieldwork investigations. She has been an avid expedition caver since 2004 and has led and participated in numerous multi-month caving <laughs> expeditions, exploring and mapping some of the deepest and most scientifically interesting caves in the world, primarily in southern Mexico. <laughs> Vicky is particularly interested in how AUVs can supplement and surpass human exploration in caves, glaciers, and other extreme environments. In, an, <laughs> in another manifestation of her affinity for remote operations, Vicky has spent five seasons in Antarctica and three seasons in Greenland, working as a robotics engineer, a field coordinator, and camp manager. Please welcome Vicki Siegel to the stage. Where's the clicker thing? Hi, y'all. Um, I haven't actually presented in the UT and Grotto in a long time, and I've never presented in this building. Um, but it's nice to be back in town. Um, and tonight I'm going to talk about a project that we did in partnership with Stone Aerospace, um, which is, uh, of course, Bill Stone's company that I do a lot of work with. Um, so we're going to talk about this project in Namibia, but I'm going to do my standard thing of giving it a little bit of background. Some of you guys will have seen a bunch of this stuff presented in the Grotto before, even though it's not 100% caving related. Um, hopefully it's still kind of cool and, and of general interest. Um, so going down this kind of like background <laughs> path, um, a lot of this work starts uh, with something called Ocean Worlds that I'll explain in a minute. Um, there's some history of, of this evolution of projects that starts in North Florida, um, some work that Bill did before, and then there's some stuff we did in Mexico, and there's some stuff we did in Antarctica, and then we went back to Florida, and then we went to Namibia, um, and I swear it's all connected. Uh, so back before I was kind of on the, on the scene here, um, 1987 and 1999, uh, Bill, um, kind of on a whim, kind of for fun, put together this, uh, basically a mapping dive scooter. So you've got divers here with rebreathers, they're in a cave, they're trying to map um, this cave using uh, this, this scooter, and it's all these little round faces here are sonar beams. So basically, they're driving the scooter through, and it's taking, much like a bat uses echolocation, it's taking measurements out to the walls uh, beyond what the, the human divers could see. And um, it was really cool, and they made cool maps, and so on and so forth, read the book. Um, but there was, <laughs> there was a lot of logistics that went into this stuff. So it was cool, but really the fact that you had to have humans involved uh, at that point in time really kind of uh, made it a lot more challenging. Humans, of course, have to go through decompression. Humans are putting their, you know, their lives at risk to do this work. Humans have to do things like breathe all of this gas. How many times? Um, it's a lot. I don't know. I read the book. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, just kind of, you know, really neat project, um, kind of, went, that kind of was the end of it. Um, until several years later, uh, NASA started going around asking for ideas about how to explore ocean worlds, and particularly Europa. And so Europa is one of the very many moons of Jupiter. It has an icy shell. Um, it has a rocky core. And we believe that because of the way that the moon orbits Jupiter, there's actually a liquid water uh, ocean underneath that icy shell, and if you're someone who's interested in finding life off of, off of this planet, this is probably the best place in our solar system to look. How would you go about looking? Well, you'd have to like melt through that ice cap, and then you'd have to have some little robot to swim around under there, and that's a lot of what we do at Stone Aerospace is play with fun ideas about how to do that kind of crazy stuff. Uh, so, following up on the work that Bill had done in Wakulla Springs with this mapping scooter, the next step was to take the human out of the equation and make the, basically make the scooter or make that technology be able to move itself around. So the, the Depthex robot was constructed, and again, it has these little sonar 
transducers on the side, little thrusters, and this thing could move in all different directions. It was basically like this eye all-seeing eyeball. We took it to a really famous cave diving site in northern Mexico called uh, Cenote Zacaton. We made this map um, on stuff. Oh. Sound familiar? You've run in my videos. Okay, so um, so this is just a, a quick example of what that mapping mission looks like sped up. All the little colored dots that you're seeing, the red and everything, are places where a sonar beam has hit a wall and made a return. So you can see the shape of this big cavern underwater um, filling in. All those yellow cones that you're seeing are basically the traces of those dis different sonar, sonar transducers hitting the walls. Um, is the cone like large in a pair? It's expanding outward as it goes. Yeah, it's just now. It's a uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then the little line down the middle is basically the vehicle trajectory. So that was you know approximately a hundred meters underwater. Um, kind of a, a neat project, fun project, really cool, cutting edge stuff for the time. Um, we then took that same vehicle chassis, a lot of the same brains. Um, we took out some of the scientific sampling stuff. We put in different scientific sampling stuff and we took it to uh, a permanently ice-covered lake in Antarctica, and we were able to map underneath the ice um, the, the shape of this lake that had never been seen by humans, really interesting to people who care about lakes, and those people exist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then we wanted to take that, the next step was to kind of take that same idea, but make it longer range. So the depth X and endurance robots were kind of like these squashed golf ball M&M looking things. Um, not really great for, for great range, so we took a lot of those same principles and kind of stretched it out into a robot, robot we called Artemis. Um, we took that back to Antarctica, and instead of going um, under an ice-covered lake, we went under an ice-covered ocean um, and did some mapping there. Um, again, cool project, but like, look at how huge this thing is. Um, this is like not, this is not a very practical robot for, for most purposes. Uh, so the next goal was to try and make this thing smaller um, and that's what we've done kind of on the side of what we've been doing these NASA projects. We've developed a lot of those same capabilities as technology has advanced, those components get smaller and smaller. We're able to make something that we can actually carry with two people and we call that thing Sunfish. Um, and this is the video. The cool thing about Sunfish is that it's not only smaller than those earlier iterations of, of vehicles, um, but it's a lot more maneuverable. So this is sped up eight times because it would be really slow to watch normally. But this is kind of the, the stealth fighter jet of autonomous underwater vehicles. Now normal un autonomous underwater vehicles, AUVs that you see, are shaped like a, a torpedo. They're long cylinder tube thing. And they get their stability from the fact that they're moving forward. The nice thing about Sunfish is that it's kind of like more a, a, of a helicopter in that it can stop, it can hover, it can do all of these like complex maneuvers and yet still have some range. It's still you know, hydrodynamic enough that it's, um, it's got more range, but we can do all of this fancy stuff that's more suited to detailed mapping and detailed scientific investigations. Um, really fun. The black tail that you see coming off the back is a fiber optic tether. That's just kind of the, the black piece is a rubber that, you know, reinforcement or protectant that we have on that. Uh, first bit of the, the fiber, but the idea with that is that we can, the vehicle's behaving autonomously, but we're able to kind of watch what it's doing, and that helps us because we're still building the code for this thing. Um, this is some docking behavior that it has. The frame rate on the video is weird, so these are actually LED lights that are blinking at a particular frequency, and the vehicle camera right on the lower nose there is looking for that and coming in and grabbing it. Um, okay, Bill, we can stop that there. Oh, yeah. Um, so our idea with that, um, this does not, the one thing it does not have is it doesn't have this all-seeing all eyeball effect of those earlier round vehicles. So it doesn't have sonars, you know, in the back of its head. It has one swath that's kind of like a paintbrush of sonar beams um, along one side. So when it maps, it'll, mm -hmm. it'll actually kind of do a spinning motion to paint in those walls, and that's part of why it has to be so maneuverable, is it has to be able to like move that arm around and, and paint into different places. So we decided to take this back to um, a place called Peacock, Peacock Springs, which is a, um, a lot of people do their first cave dives in Peacock Springs, that's where I did mine. Um, 
just a, a really easy, well-known, well-mapped, um, popular site. And we decided to take a small portion of that and see if we could map there. Robot goes in the water, divers help it. Um, and then this is just a visualization of what it looks like while it's mapping. So it's, it's doing, it's exploring itself. Um, it's going through, it's making uh, a map of the walls, it's seeing where the walls are, and then that little white smudge that you'll see sometimes is where the robot's brain has decided it is safe to move. And out of the region that it's safe to move, it will decide to move in the direction that moves it towards its goal. So in this case, we told it to move north. So wherever it has a chance to go north, that's what it's trying to do. Um, so then it gets to the, the end point that we gave it, and then it is able to use its own map that it just made to return more quickly than it got there. And sometimes you'll see it get, gets hung up. Um, it's trying to, it's not quite seeing the, the way forward and then it'll move again and we'll see a big space and it'll move again. Um, so that's how Sunfish is working. This is, the, you can see the red line of the different trajectories that we ran through several courses of mapping. Um, that cave, the cave, hand-drawn cave map from the 70s or 80s actually mm -hmm. map, matches up really well. Yeah. And I would guess that, you know, I've, never surveyed underwater um, by hand, but I'm sure it's not very easy. I would probably say that the robot map is more precise in this case. Um, mm -hmm. And then quick fly through Peacock Springs here. This is the part that I love because this is where it really feels like a cave. Like as a caver, you can look at these pendants coming down off the roof. You can look at the floor and you can imagine crawling through this space. Mm -hmm. um, super cool. Do these caves form underwater? I don't know. Because it's all three out. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. Okay. Um, so, okay, I promise we're getting to Namibia. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> Ocean World, North Florida, Mexico, Antarctica, back to Florida. Um, and at this point, we were really happy and satisfied with our success in Peacock Springs. Um, but there was this big question of like what to do next. We really wanted to push the autonomy. We wanted to push the, the self-decision-making pro processes in the robot further. We wanted to push ourselves further and like, like let the baby go a little bit more. Um, and we, we couldn't decide where to do that. And it was right around this time that um, there was a big expedition down to Cheve and I was on my way to camp two and I tore my ACL in my knee. And uh, it just went right out. Um, had to come back to the States, had to have knee surgery, had to miss the rest of the expedition. I was super, super bummed. And um, if you tear your ACL, they make you sit around for eight hours a day and put your leg in this thing that like bends it. And so in that process, you end up watching all of the Netflix there ever was. Uh, <laughs> and I came across this documentary about Africa. And this documentary about Africa had like a 30 second segment about this cave that was the largest, the largest uh, you know, water, like underground lake in the world. And it was too deep to be explored by humans and the water's crystal clear, and it's amazing, and you, you rappel right down to the lake surface and do a rubber boat, and I was like, there, that's it. That's what I wanna do. Um, so I uh, ended up writing a proposal to National Geographic. Um, they decided to fund the project. We had a couple other sponsors come in. Um, all of a sudden, I had more money uh, <laughs> in my name than I have ever, will ever again, um, no. to try and take this robot to Namibia and work with some of the world's best cave divers who have been working this uh, particular place called Dragon's Breath um, for many years and then take the Stone Aerospace Robotics team and try to have those two different groups work together to map this place that, uh, that nobody could do alone. So um, just an early drawing of the, the cave from the 80s. Um, so we ended up running this project in August of last year. We had funding from National Geographic Society uh, something called Schmidt Marine Technology Partners. Stone Aerospace put in a lot. We had some fiber people and some battery uh, sponsorship as well. Um, so Namibia, this is, it's in Southern Africa. Um, it used to kind of be attached to South Africa. Uh, they speak English, it's a beautiful country. Um, in the Northern end of the country, there is some karst um, and that's where Dragon's Breath What's the capital? Vintook. Vintook. Thank you. Which looks like Windhoek, but it is not. Um, I mean, uh, yes. Dutch. 
Dutch, Dutch yeah. yeah, a lot of Dutch, German, and British influence in the area. So we went and did a, a reconnaissance, um, my coworker Josh and I. We saw all the stuff that is like the normal Africa stuff. It was super cool. Um, we came back, we brought all the robotics team back, and we had this lovely uh, kind of like little safari camp set up in the backyard of this farm. So the, the cave is located um, on this farm. We were able to stay at the farmhouse. It was a really beautiful site. Um, and those of you who've been out to the robot ranch and been on the Rebelay course, we did our best to reproduce it here um, in, the, in the backyard. And we actually had a couple of folks at Stone Aerospace who had not previously been cavers. Finally, we like broke them down and they <laughs> decided to, uh, they agreed to be uh, vertically trained so that they could go into the cave and, and help on this mission. And um, after many years of, of disagreeing, Josh finally became a caver. Um, so, we, we're still out in the middle of Africa though, and we have this um, highly technical robot, lots of little pieces, and um, I won't go into it here, but if you want to listen to me drone on about a long, horrible story and time in my life, trying to ship a lithium battery to a third world country is incredibly difficult. And um, in the end, we had to take the battery out, put it into an electric scooter that didn't work that I bought from a junkyard for $10. And then that was able to ship, and we had to reinstall it in Africa. Um, that's, a, that's everything you have to take out to get to the battery, which is all of it. And a lot of it's held together with super glue because it's a prototype. Um, so we actually had three sites. Um, that we wanted to go to. I wanted to go to Dragon's Breath, which is this place that I had seen in the BBC documentary. Um, but when we started working with the cave divers there, they're like, oh, well, but you have to see these other places too. And the, one of the places they took us to was something called Lake Guinness, which is a lot more like the um, Zagatone cenote complex, um, just an open air cenote, really cool. Um, they're pumping water out of this thing like crazy. There were three different wells um, going out of this site. Um, but it added some nice infrastructure for us to get down to the water level. We have our mm -hmm. mission control set up here um, <laughs> and put some fish in the water along with my uh, paddleboard. Um, and in Lake Guinness, we came across something that we had never experienced before, which is that the, the place is too big um, for us to map in the normal way. So when we were in Peacock Springs, those tunnels are maybe two meters wide, um, maybe a little more, maybe a little me less. But the sonar beams are, that's within range of the sonar mapping. Um, so we were able to hit it. In Lake Guinness, the bottom was way too far away. And so the robot just kind of sat there like not really knowing what to do. Um, <laughs> but since we're able to orient it in different directions, we played around with new ideas of like, well, what if we, um, instead of having the robot you know, fly with its belly to the floor that it can't see, what if we had the, the robot go down with its belly towards the wall? And just pretend that the wall is the floor. And that worked. Um, so we, it took us a little while to kind of get that all figured out. But this is exactly what we wanted to do, is push some of these new strategies and encounter some of these new problems. Um, so uh, here's, here's what Lake Guinness looked like um, under the surface. So right at the water surface, the, the sonar can only map whatever's underwater, of course. So this is all robot-generated cave map. Everything above, up in red, was stuff that um, Bill and uh, another guy on the crew painstakingly did um, with a Disto X. Um, <laughs> and, and kind of a, a poor man's LIDAR um, to, to be able to fill in the, the top portion of that stuff. So with that kind of warm up under our belts, um, we went off to, to the real goals, which were um, on, the, on the ranch, Harrison Branch, Harrison Farm, uh, where Dragon's Breath Cave is located, there's also another place that I didn't even know about when we got the, when we got the grant, which is called Harrisieve Cave. And Harrisieve is another deep, fam apparently famous deep diving site. Um, and this is the entrance to it right here, it's this pit. Um, <coughs> since we have this view for this moment, I'll point out, um, people have been working you know, deep diving projects in this area for a long time, so very lucky for us, they had already figured out all of the logistics of hauling heavy crap into these <laughs> <laughs> stupidly far away places. So they had this neat like steel cable that went across and then like you could pull a thing out to the middle and there's a winch to like lower these buckets up and down. Um, so we wouldn't put humans into the cave that way, but all the equipment went in and that made it tremendously easier. Um, and just a different view, give you an idea of like the uh, Namibian landscape here, just super dusty red roads, 
um, here's the cave here. Um, and we ended up, <laughs> I thought the, the rescue people would, would enjoy this. <laughs> we ended up hauling the robot around in the scad litter the entire time. Like we talked to all this, like, oh, we could design this, we could build that, we could make a special sleeve, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, um, we ran out of time, and I said, screw it, just put it in the sked with some padding, and that's actually worked really well. Um, it was a good rescue practice? Yeah, no, it was great. And the thing's about 100 pounds, you know, so it's like a... Um, so here, here it is going down. Um, I, I should also add, we were really lucky to have two amazing photographers with us on this trip, uh, Kasia Birnaka from Poland and Jason Gulley from the States. Um, and they just did all of these photos are, are them and they're amazing. Um, so this is what it looks like looking down into Heresy. This is about a hundred meter drop, 110, 112. It depends who you talk to, um, <laughs> of course. But uh, all kinds of different lines for hauling stuff in and out, for cavers to go in and out. We ended up rigging a, a second drop just because we had so many people going up and down all the time. It just was taking forever. Um, and so if you're up at the top and you're looking down, you can see all of our like little stuff that we've started to like trek down there. You can see a little floating platform. You can see the robot sitting on it. And then the water um, kind of starts there. I throw this one in. Um, I said this is 100 and X meters, right? They used to go down oh. on this thing. This was like a, this is the, so this is the desert, right? You saw how dry that landscape is. This is an incredibly valuable water source that's been known for a long time. And so the original um, farmers who were working, uh, German farmers who were working this area put in this ladder and actually the, uh, one of the landowners who's still living there is this, you know, middle-aged woman, school teacher, a real nice lady. And she's like, oh yeah, when we were little kids, we would go, we would go down that to go swimming. <laughs> and this ladder is like free hanging, there are rungs missing. She, oh yeah, when I was you know, 10 years old, you go down this. So, this is crazy. So when we first showed up on the scene, not a lot of, was known about this cave. Um, so this is the, all the yellows, the air filled portion. And then everything underwater is just kind of like a big dashed line. Like, I don't know, it goes really deep. Like, well, what's stopping you? Like when I was first talking, um, to the, the divers who have been working in the area, like, what's stopping you? Like, why can't you swim further? Why can't you, you know, there's physiological lim limits to how deep you can go, but I'm like, well, why can't you just get to the wall at least? And they're like, you don't understand. We can't see it. We can't get it, like, we try. We swim until we can't swim anymore. Like, there's no, it's that big. We don't know. We don't know how big it is. Um, so it had been previously dived to, again, this number varies depending on who you ask, but it had been dived to 130, 40, 50 meters. Um, which is a significant dive, um, especially in a cave. So when you get down to that water level, this is what you're looking at. Um, it's an incredibly beautiful place. You still have sunlight coming in from the entrance. Um, and you can see this, this shaft basically just keeps going. So that, that 100 meter shaft doesn't stop just because it's water, it just keeps going. A bunch of it happens to be filled with water. So we launch the robot down, we use that same belly on the wall technique um, there are a couple sections near the near the edges of the lake that are incredibly decorated, really cool little pockets and stuff. So we've got the robot coming in there. Um, spent a lot of time like little rubber boats here. Uh, 76 Fahrenheit. Yeah, it's warm. Um, the caves are, are warm. So um, let's see, what did I want to say? About this? Okay, so. Um, Heresy, super interesting because we knew that it went down in a shaft and there was some sort of vague sense that it went off at an angle from there. There was maybe this like elbow action. And, um, and we weren't really sure uh, that was kind of the, the perception though. The, the amazing thing about this site for me was this is the first time, all the different places we had taken sunfish and done all of this work, you could see this robot when it was 100 meters down underwater. The water was crystal clear, and the whole way down, Josh and I are sitting there, and you can act, and for the first time, I could actually see with my eyes, like, the robot doing these little pirouettes and spins and doing its mapping behavior, actually, like, actually being able to see it and, and, and understand it from that level for the first time. Um, and we, we had radio communication up to the mission control, you know, computer nerd guys up top, and, um, and they're getting more nervous, like, oh, we, this is the deepest we've ever taken sunfish, do we want to keep going? Like, oh, the battery is at, 
you know, 50%, do we want to keep going, you know, and like all this sense of like kind of danger and fear that we normally have about this robot. And um, for the first time, I didn't have that. And I was like, guys, I can, I can still see it though. They're like, Vicky's 100 meters away. I'm like, no, but I can, I can see it, it's fine. There's no danger, like keep going. Um, which was, you know, maybe a little foolhardy. But um, so indeed, down we continued to go. Um, Bill doing some mapping on the upper levels there. Um, and, and this is what it ended up doing. So this is the, this is kind of tiny here, but this is the profile view of what ended up happening. Again, here's that lake chamber where we're sitting. Indeed, it comes down. It does start to do this little elbow thing. And like down through here, like we can still kind of see it. Um, and then it went through this, this further pinch. And all of a sudden, the, the ceiling just went out of view. Like uh, this is a, this is drawn as a shape on here. Really, this should be a dashed line. The, the sonar could not reach the ceiling in this dome. Um, this was huge and very, very unexpected. We really expected it to kind of pinch out right here, like looking at it as a caver, like, oh yeah, it's just gonna end right there. Um, just became this huge dome, continued going down. Um, and this, you can see in the plan view, this is a really big space. Um, the vehicle is, since it's a prototype, there's no manual that says like, oh, this is the depth rating of the vehicle, don't go any deeper than this. So we kind of had to make that number up for ourselves. And um, after various conversations, we decided based on some structural engineering, like, oh, things will crush at this depth. Uh, we decided like uh, 250 meters is the depth rating of the vehicle. And we got it down to 228 right down around here. And, um, and then the robot totally went crazy and didn't know where it was anymore which was horrifying because this is the farthest away from home it's ever been. It's way beyond the range of human divers. Um, there's, there's nothing we could do. What happened was that the depth sensor, while still in one piece and not destroyed or crushed, does max out at 200 meters. Um, so we had gone to 228 meters and it freaked out. And instead of saying like, hey, I'm freaking out or like, hey, I'm not really sure, but I think the depth is this, it just said the depth is minus infinity. <laughs> uh, which when you plug that into like a, a calculation of like I know where I am minus infinity just like throws you completely <laughs> from a loop right um, so we had to completely reboot the thing it lost the whole map that it had made oh. in that in that reboot process and so instead of doing this more efficient thing where it just follows the map back out it actually had to map itself back out and the battery was running down the whole time, and we're sitting there like, oh. um, <laughs> But luckily, someone had screen captured the old like map in progress, and so they were able to like kind of compare the screen capture map and you know to like what was happening coming back out. Spoiler alert: we made it, um, but it was <laughs> it was a really exciting, intense time. Um, yeah. Did it still cares. go? Like, did, did it have to turn around and go into the cave? Mm. Oh, it, no, it's, we could see the bottom. Yeah. That was the other thing. We could see the end at 265. So this is a little disorienting, but we're going down in Harasib. We're looking up like, oh, actually, we can't see the ceiling, but we're going to pretend. Um, and then it continues. There's this slope, and then it's, you know, this black is still, a little bit of a question, but it really kind of seems to pinch off right down there. Um, and yeah, maybe it's a maybe. It's a maybe, you know. And so this is something. Um, this is like a, a really fun part of this project. Is this like this put to rest a lot of speculation that's been going on in the deep cave diving world for 20 years? Um, sorry. Uh, there's, a, th th there's some Facebook conversations that went on. I don't know. Um, there, were some, there, there might have been somebody who had already booked like a big expedition that arrived right as we were leaving. <laughs> <laughs> to try and go down and, and, and push it further. And so it's not just mapping the cave, but it's also pushing like the deepest cave dive, you know, numbers that people care about, whatever. Um, but there, are still, but there are still these questions, right? So there's still a question in heresy. And I, I really hope that someday, you know, 30 years from now, you know, something, somebody goes back and they find that little, that little nook or cranny that we didn't see. Um, what is the resolution? Like, if there's like a one foot or two foot hole, will it see that? Or? It depends on how close okay. it is. Um, 
So if there's like a little human sized hole, the, the basic answer is no. We would, we would miss something that a human could crawl through. Um, but so would a cave diver who's at that depth for that amount of time, like you don't have time for that detailed exploration, um, just physiologically. Um, so finally, on to Dragon's Breath Cave. Dragon's Breath Cave was uh, discovered in 1986 um, in this fairly uninteresting looking, uh, un un uninteresting outcrop of uh, dolomite here. And it's just got this little like sliver of an entrance. And they put this weird little ladder in there. Um, but it's, it's not a really obvious spot. Um, so you go down this little like narrow ladder thing, you go through this kind of hallway, there's, oh, there's, we're in Africa, there's dead animal bones in the cave, yeah, like it's cool, and then it gets tight. And this is where I learned that when you make a BBC documentary, you're not actually held to like reality at all. <laughs> <laughs> because the shot that I saw, that I proposed the entire like project on, showed the entrance of Harasib. Oh. And someone repelling, and then someone landing on a boat in the water, in Dragon's Breath. Oh. What they don't show is all this business. Oh, no. <laughs> so when we first started talking to the cave divers, they're like, oh, well, we're going to make a mock-up we need. And so they like made a little mock-up of the sunfish before we ever even came there and like made sure that it would fit through all of the corners here. And like, thank goodness they did, because I was just like, oh, it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> lessons, lessons learned and, and happily avoided. Did you keep it in the skeds to get it through? We did. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Um, so, but then you do get the really cool, sh you know, shot, the really cool feeling of rappelling down into this lake. Um, this isn't a picture from our expedition, but it's the, the best um, well-lit photo of the, the lake itself. Um, huge, huge space. You cannot talk from one end to the other yeah. in this place. You're using radios. Um, so, the work that had been done previously here, really similar to Harasib, like, oh, well, it goes deep, and we think it kind of does this, but, like, we can't swim that much at that depth. Um, so you've got kind of the hillside. You've got the, you know, there's this little narrow cave passage that gets down to the lake chamber. So uh, an Italian group did a LIDAR survey of the airfield portion. Um, you get the footprint, surface expression of the lake, and then you get some diving, and uh, just kind of, I don't know, it's deep. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know, 150 meters, or something like that. Um, it's too big, it's too big. Um, and, and in fact, when we went and did the recon, you rappel down, you land on your little rowboat or whatever, and, uh, and we, we rowed our way over to this little beach area. And then luckily someone had put, some previous expedition had put reflectors on the walls mm -hmm. because you don't know where the rope was. You couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. There's no way to like know where you came from. You could paddle around that lake for hours and not find your way out. Um, so now like we've kind of seen the place, figured it all out. We still have to run that fiber down through all of that crap. Um, so we, we worked on getting that all together. Um, again, a, a shot for the, the rescue educated in the group. Um, again, these local guys, this is our our buddy uh, Christine Camp here, who leads all of the, the diving expeditions, um, they, have, they have got this down to a well-tuned system, all the pulleys, all the rope lengths, um, everything to get heavy crap in and out of a weird place. Like, they've got it dialed, and we're so lucky to work with them. Um, but yeah, there's the robot in the sked, um, <laughs> just, just barely making it. Um, yeah. And so um, they've got this little, like, so you, you go through that little narrow section, and then they've got this metal bridge um, across, and you can kind of drop straight down from there. And we ended up setting up a little inflatable platform that we anchored off to the wall, and that was kind of our working platform for the whole thing. So lower the robot down, all the stuff, all the dive gear. Um, On that last, was that sunlight or, the, or uh, headlamp? No, it's a headlamp. This, okay. is, this is all totally dark. Um, the reason the cave is called Dragon's Breath is because it is Africa, it is hot, and this place is so humid that whenever the pressure system out in the weather outside changes, you'll get this like just poof, um, blast of hot, humid air coming up and you're just sweating the whole time. Um, right here. 
pretty crazy. So we sent the robot off, it's did its little mappy thing. Um, we did have divers on site both to kind of like inform our exploration process of like, oh, well, you know, if, if the robot's not having luck in this area, maybe we should try a little bit more over here. Um, they had, you know, a lot of historical background knowledge and also recovery ability if the robot happened to fail in, a, in the range that they could still get to it. Um, these guys were super excited to, to support this project. This is uh, Don Shirley, um, read the book. Uh, <laughs> The, the fiber optic is not strong enough to hollow it out. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> technically, no. In practice, maybe. Um, not that we've ever done that. Not that we've ever done that. Um, but the, the funny thing is we did have to have this surface line from the mission, the mission control tent's kind of off screen here, um, and then runs over through the rocks down into the cave. So we ran one mapping mission where we just kind of wanted to go and establish the perimeter of the lake that we could see. And we did that, we came back the next day and uh, got all down there, everybody got into their positions, we got mission control guys up top, you know, me and Josh and whoever down on the platform in the, in the cave, and uh, hooked the robot up and there's no, um, no communication. And it's like, whoa, where in that whole system did something go wrong? <laughs> and there's a lot of factors and what it turned out being um, was that the fiber that ran across the surface was bad. Um, possibly related, there was a lot more baboon noise that day. <laughs> so it's so you could hear them off in the trees screaming, and we would leave the site at night, and we'd leave everything out. Um, maybe they kind of like came and like messed around with it. There was nothing super obvious, and so it's like, well, what would have changed that suddenly the thing wouldn't work? You know, some outside agent, maybe baboon strike. Um, but Josh was able to uh, tough it up, work in the field. This is normally done in a clean room, this whole process. This is not a thing that you do sitting in the dirt, um, but it's the Stone Aerospace way. So in the meantime, Josh is up there fixing that. And um, one of our other software guys who is trained to come down into the cave, uh, we're sitting there waiting and we're like, well, screw it. Can we just go without mission control? We're like, well, maybe. And, uh, and so we decided to just go for it. And we couldn't even talk to those guys up top. We were just like, yeah, let's just try. And so by the time Josh had repaired the fiber and hooked us back up, we were already halfway through a mission. And what they saw when their computers came up was a map that we had already been building for like an hour. So that was really awesome. That was another one of these capabilities we wanted to push. Is like, OK, can we do this with less tech stock? Can we, can we make this into like a more field deployable system where you've got like a, just a tiny little Chromebook in a little Pelican case and, and try to get this to go. Um, we also switched to using this, uh, so we did those, those mapping runs and then we wanted to go further. The cave was kind of going off at an angle, low, lots of rocks on the floor. One of the things about having that fiber um, is that you're basically trailing a huge snag hazard. And if you go around the left side of the rock and you come back on the right side of the rock, um, you've just pushed <coughs> yourself. So, something that we've been experimenting with using that I was really skeptical about at first is this onboard kind of disposable fiber where it's just spooling off like a fishing line the entire time. And if you get wrapped around a rock, it's okay because you still have enough to get home. Um, and then you can like cut that thing, pull both ends up, and, uh, and everything's good. And the stuff actually worked really well, although it was really nerve-wracking to, uh, to try and work with because it feels so delicate. Um, so we went back at it, launched again, and um, did the rest of the cave, and we got some, you know, all these photos take forever to set up and, and shoot and get right, um, but they're, they're totally worth it. Um, so you can see like the platform where I'm sitting is like way back here, um, and all these guys are over on this little beach area. There's baboon skeletons in here somewhere. Um, How did you like the water? Um, we had some, so that's sunfish light, and then I think somebody's on a, boat with a dive light, like a super bright, Jason brought these super bright dive lights um, hanging in the water there. I don't know, Bill, do you have any? Yeah, they had uh, 150,000 lumens. Oh, yeah. I guess that's a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so in the end, this is, this is what we all wanted to see, and this was, um, Super cool and yet also kind of disappointing. So 
this is the plan view, um, and here is the outline of the lake surface. This is what we could see. This is that huge space. So when we were shooting, like that shot we just saw, they were standing on the beach. I'm over here on the platform way in the back, and that's still not even much Ooh. of the cave. Um, and then here again, we've got the, the um, Disto X survey kind of coming up through here, so you can kind of see the little tight spot and then the shape of the, the chamber, and then it just goes off like gangbusters. Um, and this is kind of what we wanted. There was, when we first came into this, there was nothing that said that this couldn't have gone for kilometers. And really the hope was that like, it was just gonna go too deep for us to really go, and then we'd have to like come back and you know, redesign the vehicle for greater depth and then just go for like 20 kilometers. And that's not what happened. That we found what we believe to be the end um, of the cave. So ultimate depth, so two, 205 meters. <coughs> um, again, nobody's gonna break any records in that. It's still far beyond the, the range of what a human can do. So it's not just a question of like, how, how deep can a human dive, but you have to kind of swim to get off to the side like this. So it's not just one of these like stunts where you where you pop down and then pop right back up. Um, so it's still a, a space that a human would not have been able to see either. Is that 265 meters, is that the horizontal travel? So there were two uh, numbers. Yeah, go ahead and hit that again, Bill. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is like kind of what the 3D shape looks like in a spin, and we're still working on processing some of this stuff. Looks like a Dutch um, window too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, what was your question, Sean? Is that 264 meters? Is that the length of the cave? Oh, yeah. stuff? I think it's depth, depth from the surface. Oh, okay, gotcha. Uh, yep. Yeah, so, so, meters from water. Got it. Yeah, so red is, is water depth and then um, length. And then, yeah, Bill was mentioning, like, so after the second day, we left this, like, we left mm -hmm. it kind of right about here, where you could just see this passage going off like 175 meters wide <laughs> like as a as a you know dry caver that's unheard of it's ridiculous right um and this is an incredibly dry part of this continent and yet there are these vast water uh resources and this this farm is the only farm within like i don't know um miles and miles and miles and miles and miles that is green mm -hmm. and it's because you have this uh, so Harasib and Dragons are like three kilometers apart. It's not far at all. Um, the Lake Venus is a little further, maybe 30 miles or something. Um, sorry to switch units. Um, so yeah, we saw that. Um, and so that was kind of, that was the deal. Um, this was the team. Uh, so we had a, a bunch of folks from Stone Aerospace. Um, we were incredibly fortunate, could not have done it without um, the, um, really awesome cave divers out of South Africa and Namibia. Um, again, I want to give credit to Jason Gulley and, and Kasha for our photos. And then um, this was the first big project that I really led myself. Um, so I want to acknowledge that to you. <laughs> So that the magazine and the television show are different from the nonprofit National Geographic Society, who's actually who gives you the money. So they retain the photo rights for like 90 days, um, and then they either like say, yeah, we want to keep it, or we we don't care about your stuff. <laughs> so, so they kind of said like, oh, this is a great story, but not at this time. Um, so yeah, but it ended up there was a Discover Online did a piece, and um, we'll still write up a couple pieces. Great for different places. So, yeah. Any questions, thoughts, stuff? They were really shy about keeping their questions to the end. So. Yeah, that's what. Yeah. How did the unit, this unit, control its buoyancy? Does it overcome the expulsion? Yeah, it's there, it does not have active um, buoyancy control. It's just uh, we we try to ballast it. 
pretty close to neutral, maybe slightly positive, depending on where we're working and Can how. You change it if you're in a saving environment. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll throw some extra bolts and washers on or something. It's <laughs> highly technical, bro. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, at, at this point, you know, that would be some, that would be a feature that we would probably add in the future. Um, but right now, for this range, we're able to get away with it with uh, thruster control. Is, yeah, well. Is there an engineering limit to potential depth? It just gets harder because the deeper you go, the, the thicker the housing walls have to be that protect the battery and the electronics. Um, so we're trying to keep things small, but then you have to you want to try to keep small equals lightweight equals thin walls. Then if you're going deeper, you gotta like beef that stuff up, and then the bigger the thing is, then all of a sudden you need more battery and you need more thruster power, which means you need more space, and like it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You've so we've got air chambers within the vehicle. Yeah. Can they be liquid filled somehow? They can. Yeah. Um, and so that's something that happens on on a lot of underwater vehicles is they'll actually have oil filled chambers, and that's not that's not something that we've moved to with this process yet because we're still changing so much in all of that electronics. You saw all those crazy wires and stuff. We're still getting in there pretty frequently. Um, to change something out, develop a little further, and every time you have to deal with those oil-filled chambers, it's like, <laughs> it's just a whole nother level, right? right. Um, so I think as we move closer to, towards taking this to a commercial product and we get all of that stuff exactly the way we want it, then probably looking at oil-filled would be a, a good way to go. Any other questions for Vicky? Where's the is that a problem? Yes, especially because the best way to go is lithium batteries, and lithium batteries are incredibly difficult to move around the world. <laughs> incredibly difficult. Um, was there something? Yeah. What's the next hurdle for exploration? Do you agree with that I think. I think more autonomy. We're getting really good. Um, with making that map and coming back out on it. Um, I think trying to get, you know, further complexity. There's, you know, there's mechanical challenges, uh, you know, engineering challenges of like, okay, increasing depth rating. There's a bunch of other deep cave diving sites in South Africa um, that these guys really would love us to come back to. So we would have to, you know, redesign for greater depth. Um, I would love to see more like, video capability and like photogrammetry kind of stuff coming out of this. Um, or even like underwater lidar um, stuff, and so there's like some different like different avenues, but we're just trying to like push this towards completion before we go further. I think. Does lidar work underwater? Um, blue green. And Bill, do you want to? Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, it's highly sensitive to uh, sediment load. Yeah, so it depends on clarity. How does clarity affect the sonar? Is there a certain level at which you can't function? We haven't found it. Um, and we've worked in some pretty sludgy, weird places. Yeah, I don't know if, do you have any data on that, Bill? Like, uh, No, it's, you can have the murkiest cave diving water that you can imagine, zero is, and it just goes straight to that. Uh, she didn't mention this, but the range on that thing is 120 meters. And so if we were in the middle of a tunnel, we could be mapping at 200 what is the pulse trade like? What, how, how, how often is it just like signal? 60 Sixty. Twenty twenty hertz is the update rate. Twenty hertz, okay. So for, for people who do point cloud mapping and stuff, it's doing about ten thousand points a second. Hard to keep up with that with the handheld disc. Yeah. <laughs> 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 how many times do you take an intro? Twelve thousand in the dragon's grass. 12,000 shots. Just a shot. Second. Purple tunnel. And I assume that was digital, not your digital surveying. Yeah, with the.
take yourselves out at 9.30 or somebody who volunteer to do that. Uh, but other, yeah, pick up your trash, please. So lately, like a lot of cups are yeah, yeah. Much, like, throw that crap away, y'all. Uh, and thanks, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Kier. Oh. <laughs> and the meeting's already been here, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs>